A narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson is an example of a distinctly American genre. And some claim that Rowlandson's written account of her capture and captivity was America's first bestseller. Perhaps Emerson should have thought more about these stories of Indian capture before he declared American literature a mere copy of what existed in Europe. Accounts like hers were unfamiliar in Europe until they were reprinted there. Mary Rowlandson's experience was hardly unique in America, however, and many accounts were written by survivors of Indian capture. Today, Americans rarely worry about hostile forces attacking and kidnapping them. In the 17th century, this possibility seemed all too real. Some read these stories from raw curiosity, but in America, at least, some likely read them for hints about how to avoid or survive these ordeals. Perhaps the best modern-day parallel is the terrorist threat. Today, we read about the train attack in France, foiled by a pair of US soldiers and a third American civilian. A movie was made to present the story in dramatic form. Why do Americans watch this film? We want to know, and we want to witness the human survival instinct in action. We can imagine ourselves there. And while it is a bit harder to imagine ourselves in Mary Rowlandson's shoes, her account is compelling and troublingly real. While reading, we are reminded that sensitive Western values are hardly the norm in the world, any world, yesterday's world or even today's non-Western world. Niceties like the Geneva Convention are a Western invention, and separating detained parents from children is hardly new. The Indians, in Rowlandson's account, had no hesitation in separating her from her children. One of her gravest worries was about her son's life. Our modern sensibilities spring from a Judeo-Christian heritage of right and wrong, respect for human life, and a belief in universal rights. These are hardly the world's norm. When you read a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, pay close attention to her descriptions of her Indian captors. How does she depict them? What are they doing? What is their condition? Does she dehumanize them? What do they want in exchange for her release? Also, consider the difficult fate of the so-called praying Indians. These Indians had come to believe the New Testament teaching about Jesus Christ. They were converts to Christianity, but still Indian by birth, culture, and tradition. They could not simply begin living as some European settler in, say, Boston, Massachusetts. Neither could they return to their tribes and villages and worship Christ as if nothing had happened. There were many efforts made to convert the Indians, but few had any idea what to do with individual converts as they were made. This is one of the saddest stories of the European settlement of the New World. Popular history frequently dispenses with hats, white hats and black hats, simple depictions of good and evil to historical groups. This is so wrong. Imagine Mary Rowlandson reading some modern accounts of American settlement of the New World in which she and her fellow settlers are depicted as invading colonizers who disrupted a culture and deserved attack and even annihilation. It is analogous to Americans today reading about how we deserve the 9-11 attacks or other terrorist attacks because of some American policy regarding Saudi Arabia or general Western indifference to Islamic law. While there is room for nuance in history and literature, we too often get swallowed up in fads about sides and taking the right side in our interpretations. One of the problems that occurs when this happens is the problem of confirmation bias. We keep looking for evidence in support of some accepted narrative, and we miss all of the literature and history that does not support our view. Mary Rowlandson's story is a primary account, written by, not about its participants. Such sources should be more widely known and read in today's America.